There are so many different gins out there at the moment from all different distilleries and all different types of gins, so how do we understand them all? And then the gin label, how do we get through all the jargon when we're trying to pick a gin and tell the differences between all these different types when we're at the liquor store? Well, that's what we're talking about today, so grab a drink and grab a seat because we're starting right now. G'day folks, my name's Tim and welcome to Tim and Tonic where we discover the world's best gins and how to drink them. So the first thing you're going to notice on the label is probably the brand name. So you're probably familiar with some ones like Tanqueray or even Bombay Sapphire, two of the world's biggest and best known brands, well known for being relatively good quality at a fairly affordable price. And yes, the brand name is a little bit of a hint into what the gin's gonna taste like because, you know, each brand has their own signature flavor profile, but it's not quite like, say, whiskey or something like that, where the brand has a very distinctive style with some subtle differences between the different kinds of whiskey. With gin, there are some brands that have dramatically different tasting gins. Like, for example, both of these gins here, Bombay Sapphire and Tanqueray, they have flavoured gins in their range, which are gonna taste nothing like these two. Now, if you're well versed in gin, the first hint to what any gin might taste like, it's pretty obvious, because a lot of the gins these days actually list the botanicals on the bottle. Like, I mean, look at this Bombay Sapphire here. You can see all down the sides of it, they list you all the different types of botanicals. Now, I've said it on the channel many times, to be called gin, it has to have juniper in it as one of the botanicals, but every gin has juniper in it, so it's not really gonna tell you much about what's different between the different types. Cause, so look at those secondary botanicals, cause they're gonna give you the hint as to the flavor profile. If you're new around here, you might be wondering exactly what botanicals are. Well, gin is essentially a spirit distilled with botanicals, which can be anything. Herbs, nuts, seeds, fruits, roots, pretty much you name it, it can be a botanical. And other than juniper, which is the number one botanical in gin and has to be in gin, for it to be called gin, there are no limitations on what else you can put in there. And for that reason, that's why you need to look at those secondary botanicals to get a hint at what the gin might taste like. Now, there's a very good reason why I chose both of these bottles first, and that's because they both say on the bottle, London Dry Gin. And now you're probably thinking, Tim, why are you talking about this? Because it's pretty obvious, London, it must be made in London and dry, it's just not a sweet gin. Now, unfortunately, I've got news for you, that's not quite correct. So London Dry Gin is actually a style. It doesn't anymore have anything to do with where it was made. And yes, both of these gins were actually founded in London. They're very old school, very traditional brands, but the Tanqueray Distillery no longer exists in London. It's distilled in Scotland. And Bombay Sapphire, yes, it's made in London now, but for quite a long time, it was made up in the north of England. So this reference to London is more of a historical stylistic reference rather than actually where it's made. And now the second part of this is to be called London Dry, there's actually quite a rigorous set of standards that the gin must adhere to in able to be able to put that on the bottle. And the really quick version of it is this, to be called London Dry, it has to be above 37.5% alcohol, it has to be distilled, and then after distillation, you can't add anything to the spirit other than water. And that's really where this dry part comes into it because if you can't add anything to the spirit other than water after distillation, well, sugars can't carry across distillation. They get left on the other side. So that means that you can't add any sugar, so it's not gonna be sweet, so it's dry. So if you see London Dry, there's also quite a typical flavor profile associated with it. It is probably the most punchy of juniper out of all of the gins you can find, which to me tastes kind of woody like pine or woody like the stems of rosemary. You're also gonna find in there some citrusy flavors and usually a bit of spice, some kind of peppery flavors. And that's because these are all traditional gin botanicals. Now this word dry is starting to appear on all different other bottles. Like for example, we've got here, We've got the botanist, which says Islay Dry Gin. Now, Islay being a little tiny island off the coast of Scotland, which is very, very famous for its single malt scotch. There's no real legal protections around this word dry. A lot of these new producers now, they want to associate their brand with where the actual distillery comes from, what botanicals they're using, that kind of thing, to give it a sense of time and place. So they're adopting this term dry as the same idea as London Dry, so nothing added after distillation 
distillation other than water, but associating it to where it's actually made. Now, before we put them all away, there's just one other term I wanna talk about quickly on this Bombay Sapphire bottle here. And that's this term, vapor infused. Now, what that means is traditionally, when you distill gin, you chuck in your spirit, you chuck in the botanicals into essentially a big boiler, all together, boil it up, condense it down, there you go, Bob's your uncle, you have gin, cut it with some water, London Dry. But if it says vapor infused, the botanicals actually don't go into the spirit. The botanicals get hung in some netting or a basket, and then rather than it touching the liquid directly, it gets gently steamed as the liquid boils. So that means if it says vapor infused, the flavor profile is gonna be lighter, delicate, brighter. It captures those top notes of the botanicals really well, but leaves behind those more earthy base notes. So speaking of the spirit coming off of the still, it comes off at a really high ABV, much higher than these kind of ones that you're seeing, which are 37.5% or above. You know, it can come off 60, 70 or more, depending on the distiller's method. And so some distillers might choose to not cut it down as much. And then we have Navy Strength Gin. So the only defining characteristic of Navy Strength Gin is it must be above 57% alcohol. These days, largely, Navy Strength is just a marketing term to say kind of overproof or extra strong gin, but there's a little bit of tradition behind it whereby back in the day when they were rationing out gin on Navy ships, you know, they wanted to make sure that if they spilt the gin on the gunpowder, which was stored in the same area, by the way, they wanted to make sure that the gunpowder would still light on fire. And they discovered at this strength of exactly 57%, that was the point where it would still ignite absolutely perfectly. Now, while there's no regulation around what a Navy strength gin should taste like, it really does share on the whole those same characteristics of a London Dry. And generally speaking, it's made in that exact same way as a London Dry gin. It just happens to be a little bit stronger. But what that extra ABV and strength does is, you know, gin, you mix it. Not many people drink gin neat or straight like this. That means that you get more flavor in there because you're adding less water, there's less dilution. So it's more of that flavorsome spirit. So essentially the easiest way to think of Navy Strength gin is it's just like a regular dry gin, but in HD. Now, another really well-known type of gin would have to be slow gin. Now slow gin, a little bit easier to understand. I mean, the color and the name might just give it away a little bit. So this style of gin is infused with slow berries and this comes after that distillation with the other botanicals. So this means it retains all the color, all the sweetness and all the acidity as well. Now these slow berries, also known as hawthorn berries, technically closer to a plum than a berry, they grow pretty readily in the UK and yes, they do have some sweetness, but they tend to be a little bit more on the acidic side. So usually when someone's making a slow gin, they'll add extra sugar as well, which makes it quite a sweet gin. And also a lot of the time, the slow gins tend to be lower alcohol, as low as 25%. And technically under that 37.5%, in most countries, it's not a gin anymore. It is now a gin-based liqueur. But because of tradition, slow gin has an exception to that. I can just simply be called slow gin. It doesn't have to be labeled slow gin liqueur. But if you want to compare apples to apples, then slow gin, it's more of a liqueur. So what are we tasting with slow gin? Obviously, there's a lot of sweetness, a lot of fruitiness, you know, those richer, darker fruits like cherries, plums, berries. If it's a good quality slow gin as well, there's usually a nice level of acidity to balance out the sweetness. And finally, the traditional gin botanicals, they're in there, but they're a little bit more subtle and play second fiddle to all those fruity flavors. And now while we're talking about slow gin, I wanna bring over an Aussie version of that style, which is Four Pillars Bloody Shiraz Gin. Now this gin down here in Australia has spawned a whole category of gin. There's these wine grape infused gins popping up from all different distilleries everywhere. And the idea being that Australia is really famous for growing wine grapes. So how can we make a kind of Australian take on that traditional slow style? Now being labeled Shiraz Gin, a lot of people commonly think that, oh, they've just mixed it with Shiraz, the wine but that's actually not the case. So they make it in the exact same way as this slow style of gin. They take the whole Shiraz grapes, because Shiraz just refers to a specific variety of grape, and they infuse that into the gin base. Now, red wine grapes tend to be a little bit sweeter than slows, so you get a lot of natural sugars into these types of gin. So even if you're not a big wine drinker, because it's not wine, it's unfermented grapes, it's actually quite a bit different, and you should give it a go if you're a fan of slow gins. Not only do I find these Shiraz-based gins tend to be a touch sweet 
sweeter sometimes than slow gins, they also tend to be more complex. And maybe I'm a little bit biased, but absolutely delicious as well. Now there is another time when you might see the word Shiraz or a wine grape on a bottle, which doesn't mean this style of gin. And that's when the word Shiraz or Pinot Noir or whatever it may be, is combined with the words barrel aged. So perfect time to bring up the next style of gin, which is barrel aged gin. So combining those words Shiraz barrel aged gin means that the barrel before it held gin, it held Shiraz in it. And that is the actual wine, unlike the Shiraz gin, which was the whole grapes. But generally speaking, most of the time barrel aged gin doesn't come from X wine barrels. It comes from X whiskey barrels. And the reason for that is quite simple. Whiskey always has to be aged in a barrel to be called whiskey. Whereas wine, doesn't have to be aged in a barrel to be called wine. And even certain types of whiskey, they have to go into a brand new barrel every time. So what do they do with these barrels when they're done with them? Well, maybe they use them to make barrel aged gin. And for gin, there's no minimum period of aging. It has to go into the barrel. So you kind of have to see each gin, how long it is aged for, which is how much influence that oak and that wood is gonna have. And the most common type of barrel is ex-bourbon because bourbon barrels are that type of whiskey where you can only use the barrel once. So taste wise, you can kind of think of a barrel aged gin as a hybrid between a gin and a whiskey. And that barrel influence is much more subtle than the fruit influence in a slow gin. So those kind of botanicals, the base ones, shine through a lot better. And yet, and then those oak barrels, yes, they give a little bit of a whiskey-like taste. And those flavors you're gonna taste are usually vanillas, coconuts, toffees, brown sugars, you know, those kind of sweet, dark sugar flavors. So we're kind of going back in history with these styles of gins we're exploring now. You know, back in the day, barrels was just a convenient way to transport gin because they didn't have modern inventions like stainless steel tanks or, you know, glass bottles were not as efficient at moving big quantities. So inadvertently, it got barrel aged just out of convenience. So staying on that history train, we're gonna talk about bathtub gin. So this word bathtub probably doesn't sound very appealing, but again, it's a really old school traditional way to describe it. It's not made in that way anymore. So the defining characteristic of bathtub gin is this. Bathtub gin is not distilled like that London dry gin that we talked about. Rather than being distilled, you take your base spirit, you put the botanicals in it, you leave it to infuse, strain it off, that's it, no distillation, just an infusion of botanicals into the spirit. And this one I've got here is a very modern one from a distillery right here in Australia called Prohibition Liquor Co, which make their kind of rendition of those old school styles of spirits. And you might be able to see there, this one's got a little bit of color. That, generally speaking, doesn't come from barrel aging like the one we talked about before. That's simply all those spices and juniper they use give a little bit of color to the gin. But sometimes in certain cases, they do combine styles so you get bathtub combined with barrel aged. And these kind of more modern interpretations, they might include an element of distillation and infusion, but traditionally it was purely infusion. And now the reason why it's called bathtub gin is because it originated in America during prohibition. Back then, they couldn't buy alcohol legally. It was completely illegal. The only way they could get it is from more industrial sources rather than drinkable sources. So to make it taste nice, what they did is they infused botanicals into it in their bathtubs because that was just a big vessel that they had in their house that was inconspicuous that people didn't give a second look to. But nowadays, it's more modern interpretations of that classic style. So it's really well made, it's really tasty. The difference between a bathtub gin and a London Dry style gin in terms of the flavor profile, because there's no distillation, you get much more of those earthy base notes, those spice notes, and also you get a little bit more bitterness coming through too. Okay, now let's go a little bit further back in history than bathtub gin, and we have some Old Tom Gin. So what does Old Tom Gin mean? Well, quite simply, it means that the gin is lightly sweetened. And flavor-wise, comparing it back to that London Dry style of gin, very similar in terms of the botanicals that make it up and flavor profile, just has that added sweetness. And that added sweetness could come from pretty much anything. It could be plain sugar, it could be honey. I've even seen one with maple syrup. So imagine 
Classic dry style of gin, but lightly sweetened. And Old Tom Gin has quite a fascinating story. It comes about back in the kind of 1700s in England where they tried to tax the hell out of gin because there was this gin craze going on and people were just getting drunk and falling over on the streets and all sorts of, you know, socioeconomic problems. And all that these taxes did was drive the production and sale of gin underground. And you know, back then the technology of distillation wasn't as good as what it is now. So they had to add sugar and sweeteners to kind of round out the rough edges. But specifically this old Tom name comes about because the way you would buy gin is there would be these cat plaques on walls in London and you would go up to them and you would put a coin in this cat plaque and there'll be a bartender on the other side and he would dispense a shot of gin which would come out through this cat plaque. And then last but not least, a bit of a curveball because this one on the bottle, it actually doesn't say gin at all, but it wouldn't be complete without talking about Geneva. So pronunciation, spelling, I'm not going to get too much into that, but Geneva, 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 however you want to say it, completely fine. And you might even see it spelt in different ways with a J or a G, also completely fine. And like I said, technically not a gin because it doesn't say gin on it, but we have to talk about this one because it's the precursor to all gin. So this is where the Brits took their inspiration from gin from. When, you know, back in the day, they were fighting in these wars on continental Europe, and they discovered this Geneva, which the Dutch people were drinking. And so what's the difference between Geneva and gin? Well, simply Geneva isn't made with a neutral base spirit. It's made with what they call a malt wine, which I guess in a way you could really describe it as kind of like an unaged whiskey. But then the way it becomes more like a gin is it's actually flavored with juniper. So again, we have another style of spirit that's kind of blurring the lines between gin and whiskey. And you can see this one that I've got here has a little bit of color to it. So Genevas come in both barrel aged and not barrel aged variants. If you see a bottle that says Oud Geneva on it, that simply translates to old. So it means it's been barrel aged, but there's plenty of clear unaged versions of Geneva out there too. In terms of taste, obviously that defining character comes down to using a base spirit that's not neutral. So you get these kind of really malty, fresh baked bread, grain, cereal kind of notes to the Geneva. But on top of that, obviously it has some juniper in there too. So you get those woody rosemary stem kind of flavors. And obviously depending on the brand, there might be some other flavors and botanicals in there too. So guys, after all that, you're probably wondering, how do I drink all these different gins? What drinks go well with all these different styles? Well, you probably want to click through the video that's popping up here right now to find out all about that. But I hope you enjoyed the video guys. Cheers. See you next time.